Hi, and welcome to another episode of Alta Heron. My name is Rob Runacres, and as ever, I'm joined by Hans Jordlins, who's going to introduce tonight's guest. You, you sound so happy every time you say that. Hi, everybody. To, tonight, we uh, have Oscar Temores from the Netherlands with us. Hi, Oscar. How are you? Hi, I'm, I'm doing quite fine. How are you guys? We're fine. Yeah, uh, and tonight, we're going to talk about uh, Messer. The weapon Messer. So, and you will guide us through the the weapon and the different types of treatises with, with this weapon. Can you first yes. define what is a Messer? Is it because it's not a sword? So, what is it? Well, pretty much, it is just a knife, um, and that is a really simple way to um, make the distinction. It is. Um, uh, it can be anything really. It can be from something like a really big kitchen knife. Um, to uh, a great weapon of, of war that is as long as a long sword or sometimes even longer uh, it's a it's a very broad definition and it uh, encompasses all kinds of weapons and the most defining uh, aspect about a messer and this is the theory that i find most credible there are several others is the fact that these are being made by knife makers uh, in general at least in the very early stages later on proper swordsmiths also start making messers and things get a more, bit more complicated but pretty much a messer or rather a langus messer is just a, a long knife that also has a function for fighting and later on uh, i think this started in the 19th century um, and we're still doing this we got really fond of categorizing these things so the term langus messer usually refers to something that's used in fencing generally something between 70 centimeters and, and, and 90 centimeters long. You have a Bauernbeer, which is just kind of like a modern machete. It, it's mainly a tool, but you can also fight with it. And you have the term Kriegsmesser, which tends to denote the really long curved messers that you often see in the hands of hands of uh, Landsknechts in the late 15th and early 16th century. So it's, it's probably fair to say that the, the categorization, the typologies we see in the Victorian period are imposed rather than actually realistic or, or historically accurate. It's an attempt to try and categorize these things into a family when it's messes just a general term. Um, as, as far as I'm aware, yes. Um, all these things would be considered uh, a long knife. Um, I've, I've studied violence in, in uh, cities in Holland, which is um, the province where I live, and they were very diligently writing down which types of weapons were forbidden to carry in the city. And they tend to mention um, long knives and nail knives, which I think refers to what we call messers, but they don't specify what types of length, just generally long knives are forbidden for everyday carry in the city. So. Yeah, at least here, um, I would say that that's the case, and probably in the rest of the medieval European world as well. Okay, and you have you have a messer right there with you, right? Yes, I have two uh, with me. I have a sharp messer. Um, this is made uh, from a machete uh, to be used for cutting. It has a bit of a curve, and the other one is the messer I use for sparring and training techniques and you see this one is kind of more straight um mm -hmm. and they all kind of fall in the category of what we now call a longest messer which it can be used for fencing and using um, to apply techniques that we see in treatises and you mentioned a uh, nail knife the nail of the messer can you show that yes um yes, yes the people who are not aware of it the nail yeah as yeah. you can see, um, <laughs> something protruding from the guard here, um, and that's a really big nail. And this basically has two functions. Um, one of them is to keep the, the cross in place, um, as opposed to a sword, the cross of a messer. I'm, I'm attempting to show it here. I'm not sure if it actually registers. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it, it doesn't... Um... Don't stab your cat. That's always... Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the... Um, the, the, the cross goes all the way over the blade and it isn't uh, slotted in like you would see in a sword. Um, and that makes that it has more allowance to move, so you want to keep it shut. Um, so you put a nail through it. And that was probably the original function. And don't pin me down on this, because there are other people who know way more about this. Uh, and probably later it then evolved into some sort of hand protection. And by the 
mid to late 15th century, you see that the nails actually becomes uh, an, an integral part of how to use a measure. It is used to keep your hands safe, uh, allowing certain types of parries that you can't do with a regular sword. And you also use it for several other actions in a bind or in wrestling. So you use it both in a defensive and an offensive way. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Rob, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering: is it um, usually a single-bladed weapon with, you know, a kind of a wedge shape in the blade uh, for for cutting, or do you have um, uh, two edges on some of them? Uh, there are lots of variations, really. Um, uh, I think James Elsley made a really nice uh, typology of messers. Uh, but personally, I've seen, seen some originals that uh, have two edges on them. They're, they're quite rare. Most of them have, have one edge um, and are very much geared towards cutting. But you see, you see two uh, edge tech examples as well. And do they have mass? I mean, do they do they have like this this, this weight behind them? Um, because I, uh, we were talking before we started broadcasting about when you and I fenced, and I was using a, uh, a side sword. Um, a, a 16th century side sort of thing, and I I could not bind, I could not meet your uh, your messer because of the the weight and the power behind it. So I was basically having to always go weak and disengage and and, and come around like that. So did did these generally have uh, sort of sort of a real power behind them, real weight uh, for application? Well, let me just say that I've never actually cut with an original, uh, unfortunately, or maybe that's good. Yeah. Um, they don't stand up to that, don't want. <laughs> but um, I do cut sometimes with my messer, and I noticed that cutting with a messer as opposed to longsword is, is kind of like a cheat mode. It is just really easy. Um, there's there's two reasons for that. One is, in fact, uh, what you mentioned, the, the weight of the weapon. It's kind of choppy and has a lot of presence in a bind uh, because of that. And another thing is that messers tend to have uh, quite some uh material still towards close to the tip uh long swords tend to taper into uh very sharp points quite often and messers have that a bit less you see that they have the um, have a clip point which means that there's far more mass towards the the tip mm -hmm. so it's very easy to cut even if you're cutting at the tip the this might be because the messer doesn't vibrate as much as a sword would but that makes them really easy to cut with and also really easy to strike into a bind with. Just, well, you, you said something interesting there, and I hope this isn't too much of a digression. When, when you're coming into a strike then, you're saying it doesn't vibrate too much. Um, are, are you actually finding when, when you're actually getting these striking together, is, is there a particular form that you have to do to enable yourself to deal with this power that's coming in with your counter power? Um, um yeah there is um I'll, I'll probably be talking a bit more uh, about that when we start actually describing some some of the manuscripts that are, that we were that messer fences can work with but it is kind of relevant uh, how you strike um if you meet a high strike uh with something coming from below you are going to be usually not as strong um as when you meet the same strike with a strike from high and that that Kind of informs how how some manuscripts say you have to deal with different types of strikes and also can tell you what kind of strikes the manuscript wants you to use in the first place because they don't always mention that okay let, let's start go, talking about the different uh, manuscripts then um can you can you mention like the uh, couple of few that you work with or with, with that the has the messer yeah well when you, when you talk about messer you can't really uh go without mentioning uh, Johannes Leckerschner's um, manuscript. That, that seems to be kind of the center uh, where everything is revolving around. Um, even people who explicitly don't use Leckerschner have to mention that, like we use everything else but not Leckerschner. But, but, but that manual is focused uh, completely on Messer, right? Yeah, it's a rarity in that, that sense that it is uh, completely focused on Messer, and, uh, but it's not the only manual that has some interesting Messer things. Largely, by the by, way, you could say that you have Messer before Lekuchner, you have Lekuchner, and then after Lekuchner, where quite a few manuscripts are influenced by him. So, and when, when was uh, this, when was uh, Lekuchner published, uh, written? Um, well, he, uh, Jonas Lekuchner published uh, one manuscript in 1478 and then another one in the year he died in 1482 
So it's it's already quite late in the 15th century, and that's interesting because most of these Messer manuscripts are pretty late. We we tend to um, we tend to look at them sometimes from uh, the point of view of longsword manuscripts, and there are just more longsword manuscripts in this in the earlier period than Messer manuscripts. And and where, where was this published? Yeah. Um, and that's quite, quite interesting. They were all pre pretty much published in southern Germany. Um, so Lekkerchen was published in Nuremberg. Um, so a few other manuscripts from around the same time were published in Augsburg, for instance. Uh, um, there's also some manuscripts that mention Messer uh, from Ingolstadt. So it, it's pretty much the same area in southern Germany. So there's quite some possibility for, for these manuscripts to influence one another. So is, is this therefore a regional weapon? Um, no, but the tradition that most, uh, most of us are working with is very regional. Um, you find them all, all over Europe. Um, I think in the Baltic states they were quite popular, in the Low Countries they were very popular, and all over Germany we find excellent examples. But the fencing treatises that we use, um, or at the very least the early ones that, that most practitioners use, are all from this very limited geographical area from southern Germany around the city of Nuremberg. Okay. okay. And this this manuscripts or these these two uh, treatises rather that you're you're saying, um, they were they're quite influential. You say. I mean, did they were they immediately influential? Were people drawing off these straight away? Uh, what, what do we know about this? Um, yeah, they were quite influential, and, and pretty soon after these things were published, they start influencing other fencing manuscripts. Um, Peter Faulkner is, is quite a famous example. He works. Um, Peter Faulkner was captain of the Marx Brüder, and I don't know from the top of my head where he was working, but in his the part of his manuscript that deals with Messer is just. A rather an abbreviated version of Lekkerchen. Mm. And you also see in, in later manuscripts that some references to techniques mentioned by Lekkerchen are there. Uh, so it, it spreads across the larger German area uh, quite soon after his death. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've got anything else, Hans. I was wondering if we can we can dive perhaps into this treatise then and you perhaps talk us through what, what he's telling us to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I'll start off with making a bit of a comparison uh, between Lekkerchen and the earlier uh, sources. Um, so that means they'll have to describe those earlier sources a bit more. Um, the ones that I'm most familiar with is the one from the Nuremberger Hausbuch, um, commonly known as the Döbringer manuscript, um, the one with all those numbers and letters that no one ever can remember. <laughs> and um, that has a few ground rules um, and, and no actual techniques. So there's some descriptions about that there are specific type of footwork. They say that Messer is the basics for for some other weapons, like first learn Messer, then learn Longsword. And if you're fighting, then you use the left hand to attack the right hand. And that's pretty much what the manuscript says. You have a Talhofer's manuscript, which um, the ones that contain Messer techniques are published a few years before Lekkerchen uh, was writing. And you also have Paulus Kahl. Um, there are quite a few similarities. Oh, and, and uh, Kodes Wallerstein as well. Yeah. They're all roughly from the same area and they all contain um, a few techniques and some, some basic rules. But these, uh, these manuscripts are quite limited in scope um, for several reasons. One, they just contain very few techniques if you compare it to Lekkerchen. Um, and that's mostly because Lekkerchen just has so much. Um, Codex Wallerstein only has eight techniques. Uh, Thalhofer, three with some variations. Mm. So there's not much to go upon. And what these manuscripts tend to do, they deal with an attacker that throws uh, a cut from above. And then you get a few options. You, you can, can do them some wrestling, there's some some cutting at um, shallow targets like like the wrist, but the, everything starts with someone trying to strike you through the head with a very powerful uh, downward blow. And the interesting thing that Lekker then does, he he builds an entire system. So that's what's kind of interesting as opposed to these earlier manuscripts. 
Black Lives Matter makes an entire system that works not only if someone is striking a cut from above at you, but also if you want to attack. Or what happens if someone comes from below? Uh, what happens if you uh, start with an attack from your left? And that's we, quite a difference. Do we have any, any indication why this becomes a system? Is it just that there'd always been a system and you know, you've got an individual who is uh, more willing to codify this? Um, or is it, is, do we have any idea, is this more uh, becoming a more socially relevant thing um, as, as we see in other sort of forms, or do we just not know? Um, well, there's quite a bit of a discussion about this. Um, so I think the, the correct answer would be uh, we don't really know precisely. What we do know is that Lechner, um wants us to think that there always has been a system. So uh, he um, does two things. He has uh, a zettel, so a short a poetic uh, mnemonic verse that uh, that uh, enigmatically describes the fencing art. And then there is a gloss, so he explains what's being said in the verses. And he tries to make it look as if this verse is some sort of older master that comes up with this art, and that he is just a mere uh, glossator who tries to make sense of it and tries to explain it to us. I'm not sure if that's the case, probably not. Probably he has just written the verse and then pretends to be the, the guy explaining it to us uh, because this was a popular form for other fencing books of the time as well. Yeah. Much of, of Leckerson's manuscript is based off probably Jut Leo's uh, Longsford uh, treatise and it follows the same structure with a, with a cryptic verse and an explanation of that verse. So um, that doesn't answer the question though. So what I think is there is probably something of a system, but Lechner really dives into that, uh, tries to apply um, this, this way of ordering a fencing art that's already there to what, what he knows of Messer fencing, and then delves deeper and comes up with a few extra things as well. But the main characteristic of uh, his manuscript is that he puts a lot of different things together. And not all of these two things go too well together, but he tries to put it in nonetheless. And, and that's how it ends up being a very big, really a huge manuscript. Okay. Do we know anything about him, the, the person, the, Kushner, the the guy who wrote this? Um, yeah, the, the, there's a few things that you can, can learn about him um, that are quite relevant. Uh, and, and, um, one, he's probably from a family of, of bakers. Uh, Le Kushner, refers to some sort of older German spelling of Lebkuchen, so uh, pastry bacon. Uh, he himself, though, was a cleric, so he went to university and spent the later years of his life as a well-established uh, cleric with his own parish. And that might explain why his manuscript is the way it is, because um, at medieval universities, uh, students were taught um, various uh, disciplines, but they always um, had to have a scientific way uh, for the time of looking at these things and writing down as much as uh, possible about them. So and much of that was collecting knowledge that was already there and um, codifying it and passing it on to later generations. So what you get here is a cleric from some sort of an elite uh, environment who takes looks at uh, fencing art that exists on the streets and tries to codify that and add some some elements of zone to it. This this is interesting for me. So what we're not doing, because there, there's the common myth in HEMA that, you know, someone at the end of their fencing career is wanting to write their book to impart their wisdom and possibly make some money uh, to, to advertise themselves. But what, what you've got here is, is potentially a practitioner wanting to codify and, and, and collate rather than necessarily you know establish themselves as the master is, is that what you're driving at um well yes and no uh, i think this is this has very much to do with his background as a cleric um so the way they are taught to deal with information in these universities is, is collecting the information and passing it on Universities all also tended to be hives of scum and villainy in those times, uh, where students 
would often engage in illegal practices um, involving drinking, but also fencing, um, much to the annoyment of the authorities. Um, thank, thank God that's not the case these days. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go on, Oscar, go on. So, <laughs> so, um, so, so there's also quite a few references to uh, fencing competitions um, there. So the chances are that, that in his, his younger days, he, he was probably an avid fencer as well, um, which gave him the experience uh, with the material and his uh, education gave him a way to deal with that material, um, to write it down. Um, there's a few, few references to um, to him being a cleric that that are quite funny. At, at some points, uh, at some points he uses rather common phrases in Latin that he use in uh, clerical text quite often. Uh, so at, at some point, when when a new te technique starts, there's uh, there's a, a sentence like uh, "sequitur textus," so, so the text goes on. Um, there's a few techniques that end with amen, so we have these very weird sentences like strike towards his messer, strike him through the head, amen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Who is the intended audience for this manual? Uh, well, well, not everything is, is crystal clear on the subject, but we know that uh, the last manuscript was um, dedicated to Philip the Upright, uh, which is the, uh, the elector of, of the Palatine, and that means that its intended audience was likely a courtly one. Um, as always with these dedications, you're not actually sure if the person dedicated uh, to whom the manuscript is dedicated actually reads the thing and uses it, but its intended audience was a courtly one, and that will influence some of the, the contents of the manuscript as well. Um, that's quite interesting because the master is a, a weapon of the people. It, it starts out as a tool, uh, as, an, as a knife, uh, commonly associated with commoners. Um, and interestingly, we know that this may, that it makes its way into uh, courtly combat as well, especially Maximilian, uh, the later Holy Roman Emperor, has himself depicted fencing with messers quite often. So it, it, it's very much like uh, rich celebrities these days wearing jeans with, with holes cut in them. I mean, that's very much, much a workman's thing, uh, but rich people uh, take up these, these items of fashion uh, and, and wear it and make it their own as well. And I think something similar is happening with the Messer in this period, that it makes its way into noble courts and nobles want to learn uh, Messer fencing as well. Hmm. Does that affect the style of fencing then? I mean, uh, we, we can't always assume that um, any form of fighting is immediately for self-defense. And uh, I, I sometimes think it's a, a teleology to assume that everything is for self-defense and then it becomes ritualized. But do, do we actually see that um, if this is for a courtly audience, that we see certain aspects that have become um, socially acceptable or, or, or you know have, have that sort of um appeal to an elegant audience um yeah well the we we move a bit to the contents then so so if it's a courtly audience or alternatively what other people suggest uh more like rich burgers mm -hmm. that that affects the the contents of the manuscript quite um that there as far as what i gather from the manuscript there are kind of three main contexts that's that um techniques can fall into there's a little bit of self-defense here and there. It is there. Um, there are a few techniques where Lekusner says, uh, if you really want to make a quick end in fighting, you do this and that. And it mostly comes down to striking the guy in the fingers really hard so that they drop the messer. Um, and for the rest, keeping uh, the guy away from you using the Langenort. So take the messer, stretch your arm out as much as you can uh, in a motion that kind of resembles, please don't kill me. Um, and that buys you time uh, to snipe at fingers and make sure that the other guy can't attack you anymore. I, I, I spar with that sometimes, it gets boring really quickly. Um, <laughs> this is the reason why the rest of the manuscript uh, does not consist of the self-defense techniques, because self-defense techniques are boring. They are meant to end the fight really quickly, mm. without, with the least amount of risk uh, in, involved. And with a one-handed weapon uh, against other one-handed weapons, it, it usually involves uh, striking the outer extremities as much as you can. So they are there, but they're kind of boring. Um, the, the second category is, is uh, 
obviously more meant for, for show fencing. Um, and quite often, uh, reference is made to a fest shula, so a public fencing event. Um, so, so that's where you have the rich uh, to moderately well off burgers coming in. They would go to such events uh, and show off their fencing. Um, and then they tend to be rather very spectacular and very humorous pieces. So, and they're quite explicitly mentioned as, as things that you can use in a fest shula. So, for instance, the unnamed, it's something that you should not the teach to everyone because it's a very secret technique and uh, very few people should learn of this it's a very good uh that's a very good commercial statement to sell your manuscript of course and it pretty much involves uh um, an arm lock which gives you control of the opponent and you can can march him into a bag or you can sit down and play games um they're kind of meant to will almost humiliate your opponent. So so if you're fencing someone who's way below you in skill level and doesn't pre present a challenge at all, you make the fight entertaining by uh, folding them up into pretzels and, and doing fun stuff with them. <laughs> um, there are a few other techniques that, that for instance, deal with so-called Freifechter. So that might be a reference to the guild or it might be a reference to a specific type of fencer. Um, I'm not sure yet, but it's very clearly described what they do. They make long free strokes and they don't parry that much. So like you know, give some some options for dealing with that. But the majority of the manuscript, I think, is more for uh, meant for one-on-one -on -one dueling. Uh, at least that that's where they work best. And for those techniques to work, you need to have um, an understanding between the two fences mm. that the goal of the fight is to gain control of the opponent either by setting the point on making a clear strike or disarming or throwing the opponent and most of these techniques will only work if your opponent has the same mindset as you and that's something uh, i see quite a lot of sparring so if, if someone enters a, a fight with a mindset of, of just wanting to score quick points you you you're getting the self-defense technique. So lots of hand sniping uh, fight doesn't look particularly spectacular. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grinning here from ear to ear because um, as, as people will know, I'm, I'm passionate that fencing is, a, um, is an intellectual exercise of technique, not of um, hitting someone 30 times and receiving 29 in return. So, so this, is this essentially what the, the concept is here? Yeah. Um, so the most enjoyable fights for me are the ones where we stick to this, this idea of a fencing art. We want to show that we can control the opponent and anything other than a clear uh, show of control is just not good fencing. It's not what we're after. Did, was, but is this something that's explicit in, in the text as well? Is there any, any sort of discussion about tournaments and competition and how, how they view it at the time? Um, no, this is kind of implicit. This is something I read into it. Um, so it is an interpretation. So people may disagree with me in this, uh, to be fair. But there are some references to competitions, as I mentioned, but those are just the, the special techniques, um, the very theatrical ones. Um, there's, there's, to... uh, the re reason why I'm interested in this is um, there's a very good article by Olivier Dupuy, which I'm not sure is published yet, but it, he, he mentions that in Strasbourg, um, you have a lot of artisans fighting and they're basically, um, I think it was a, may have been a German who was visiting and, and was appalled by this because they're wearing giant almost oven gloves on their hands um, and their, their heads are sort of completely bare and they're sort of covered in blood. So there's, there's A, there's the, um, um, the respect of the hands because that's someone's trade and if you break the hands they're out of work yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the family out, but it, it, it's, it's um, you know, also going for a deeper strike. So I'm just wondering if there's any of this sort of uh, thing that's coming out in, in, in this treatise. Well, not explicitly, but implicitly it's very much there because the, um, the targets for, for most of the techniques tend to be the, the face and the torso. Um, and then you have this very small sliver of attacks to the hands. Um, and for the rest, what's left is, is uh, disarms and throws. And there are quite a few of them. Um, Yoli Takala once wrote a really good, almost a dissertation on the subject, where he just made these pie charts of, of uh, what, all the different kinds of openings and different types of attacks. And you see that most pieces tend to uh, end with a thrust to the face. Uh, 
So it is a serious fencing art, but you go for deep targets and you go for some sort of control. So you mentioned there's a lot of wrestling that's going on. Is that because when, when you're closing in with these things, do things collapse quite quickly? Um, or is, this, is, is there much more of a mobility that, because the, the impression I got there was that people are coming together and it collapses. Um, but do, do you have a more mobile view on this? Perhaps you could describe the actual style of fencing, how people are moving on that. Yeah, well, when, when, when you fight with longsword, you tend to, and, and I'm, I'm getting this from, from people who know a bit more about longsword than I do, um, when you fight with longsword in the German tradition, you generally want to work from the bind as much as you can. And you only wrestle if someone comes into you. So the pieces that, that uh, do wrestling are um, Dorflaufen. Someone is trying to get in close, you go close at the same time and throw them over. This is there in Lechusner as well. So you have a few techniques where someone is just rushing you blindly and you just trip them. Uh, and they work really well. But something else you have uh, is, is something you see in Fiore quite a lot, where you intentionally go in for a wrestling action. Um, the reason why you can do this, I think, is, well, twofold. One is, is because the blades are just shorter, so the difference between uh, thrusting distance, striking distance, cutting distance, and then wrestling distance is, is just smaller. So one small mm -hmm. misstep means you're in wrestling distance and you have to deal with it. Uh, the other one is that you tend to, because you're both fighting with the right hand, um, the other one doesn't then tends to stay out of the equation uh, at first. So you tend to get wrist bites quite a lot. So that means that you get the, with the cross of the messers really close to each other and it, it, the wrists tend to be a few centimeters apart. So it's really easy to get close and start to control the, uh, the other person's arm rather than the blade. Mm. Um, and that, that, that is the setup for most of the intentional wrestling actions. So if you want to go in and wrestle, you tend to do an Entrusthau, which is the Messer version of the Zwerhau for, for the longsword people. Mm. And then you start doing some wrestling stuff, usually at the arms, but sometimes even body wrestling. Is it, is it an easy manuscript to follow as a student if you kind of, if you want to start studying this manual? Is it easy? Yeah, you shake your no, head. <laughs> it is. Um, there, there, there's quite a, there's, uh, there's a few people actually who really don't use Lekishner and to some extent I agree with them because it's, it's a manuscript with a lot of pitfalls. It has a lot to offer. It, it, it's, in my opinion, the, the one that, the manuscript from Esther that has the most comprehensive system. Uh, it has a lot of things, but there's a lot of pitfalls as well. One pitfall is just the size of this thing. Uh, it has hundreds upon hundreds of techniques. Um, yeah, how, how many pages is this? How big is this um, treatise? You ever mentioned that? Um, let me just look this up really quickly because they have folios, which uh, and a folio tends to contain between one and three techniques generally, and it has four hundred thirty-two folios. Hmm. Wow. Okay, yes. so we're talking what twelve hundred? Techniques, essentially? Uh, probably. Um, this is a bit of a guess. I, I never counted them. Um, mm. Some people might have. Uh, but it's just a lot of techniques. And, and a lot of these things are just variations and counters and mm -hmm. counter counters, etc. Yeah. So it's, it's if you start using this manuscript, it's really easy to get lost. Um, it's a beginner's mistake when you work with Lekun to start at the beginning and then work it through. Um, and, and the risk you're running is that you get discouraged because uh, you spend all your time and energy at training and trying to work with this manuscript. Uh, and after months, you pretty much cover two chapters of it, which is almost nothing. A question for you then, if someone wants to get into Messer, um, and I mean, I, I, I don't always feel that a treatise is the best place to start with, but um, no. you might have some suggestions on that. And f as a follow up to that, what, what would you say is a good treatise to sort of uh, dip your toes in? Um, well, one that's really good uh, because it has a quite a big variation of techniques is the Glasgow uh, manuscript. It's one that's that's not obviously influenced by Lekkerchner. Um And it's one of these, these relatively simple treatises. I think it has 16 techniques or so. Um, yeah. 
but it's very varied. So you actually have some more than just someone kind of giving you uh, a cut from above. And this is relevant um, because this actually gives you a bit of a system to work with. It's a very simple system. Um, most of the stuff that's in there is also in Lekwishner, but it, it gives you a basic uh, a set of basics and that allows you to start somewhere. And, and from there, can you go into Lekwishner and, and, and dive into it at that point? Or is there a way in which you think someone should approach that? Um, well, it, you can also start with Lekwishner, uh, but in that case, you need to make it really clear uh, what are the things that Lekwishner wants you to already know. Um, one of them is, is what types of strike do you use? So what I mentioned, uh, make the long strikes. Because if you make, um, so that means the Lugensland, the, the high guard, is actually with a stretch arm like this, and you bring the messer down. So large round strikes that go through long point. Um, you need to be able to defend yourself a bit. So such basics, um, along with how to step, some, some a bit of simple basic footwork, are kind of what is needed to dive into lecture. So for that, um, get an instructor who knows a bit about single-handed swords, really. Uh, and this, this is just general basics. So anyone who does Dukesack or side sword can, can teach you some of these basics. And then you can dive into lecture and see what's specific about this. Um, so when you say that, just, just to be clear, when you mentioned Dusak and, and side sword, are we talking that basic passing footwork is probably the best way to do rather than say a, a, a gathering step one or is, is it really more universal than that? Um, yeah, the, the kind of the usual uh, passing step footwork along with triangle steps, uh, they give you all the basics you need. Then Lekusner adds a bit of footwork, uh, which is called the double step, um, but he'll teach you about this in the manuscript. And double step is stepping out, making a gathering step, and then stepping out again. So it allows you to cover a lot of distance, uh, either forward or sideways, uh, in a really short amount of time. Mm. And that's very specific to Lekusner. Um, it, it gives you the option of getting really close really quickly or getting into a really advantageous uh, angle really quickly. So if I were to step under a blow uh, with a double step, I'd be able to get behind my opponent to strike him in the back of the head. Um, this is very specific thing. Um, but it's actually quite well described in the manuscript, I think. For the rest, the basic stuff is, is, isn't really described anywhere, but that's just general footwork. You can even take some stuff from, from Longsword, um, because that's just the same as with Messer. Okay, and uh, you mentioned earlier that the, there were some specific uh, uh, events that focused on Messer, right? Messer yeah. symposium or something. What, can, can you mention what, what, what was the name again? Uh, the Messer meeting. Um, the Messer that, meeting. Okay. They're, they're, they're two right now every year. Um, one in uh, Utrecht, uh, organized by mostly by Bob Stuxen uh, and a bit by me, okay. um, and, and Lopez and the rest of the guys at AMIC. Um, and there's also one in uh, Strasbourg coming up real soon. Uh, cool. That's a summer Messer meeting. Um, and those are two events that I know that focus exclusively on Messer, but interestingly, they're, they're, they're more focused on, on free play. So in that sense, they're, they're kind of like the Berlin Buckner Buzz. But uh, Oscar, uh, thank you very much for coming on to on Alta Heron. It was fantastic, very, very informative, very interesting to hear you talk about Messer. Uh, Thanks for having me. Okay, thank you very, very much. Nice. Thanks very much. Cheers. Cool. <laughs>